Hello everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. I'm trapped inside because of the coronavirus. So uh, I've recently read a book. It's been a while. I haven't been able to focus on one for, for very long, but uh, this one I just kind of jumped into because from the first page, I knew I was going to hate it. And for some reason that just relieved all of the pressure. I just settled down and was like, I'm just going to read this. I'm probably not going to enjoy it. But at the end of it, I will have read a book and hopefully that will jolt me back into wanting to read. So I didn't actually choose this book. This is a book that my mum bought me home from the library. She actually works at the library, so she, she, she brought me quite a few books in the past. A lot of them I don't read. This one, it grabbed my eye because it seemed to be a thriller. Uh, and I was sort of in that place where I just wanted to read something quick, uh, something with a lot of... Uh, suspense and mystery that would really kind of keep me reading it so it's called the coven uh, and it is by graham masterton who uh, i'll talk to you a little about in a minute and it is apparently a number one international bestseller unfortunately it is the second book in a series and i obviously hadn't read the first in the series but um as someone who has just finished this book you don't really need to have read the first book in the series because one the main character talks about things that have happened in the first book enough that you kind of know what happened uh, and also the previous life of the main character doesn't really have a huge amount of bearing on this story which takes place in an entirely new location and with an entirely new cast of characters so the blurb is thus and i have to admit this blurb did capture my attention london 1758 beatrice scarlet the apothecary's daughter has found a position at st mary magdalene's refuge for fallen women she enjoys the work and soon forms a close bond with her charges the refuge is supported by a wealthy tobacco merchant who regularly offers the girls steady work to aid their rehabilitation but when seven girls sent to his factory disappear beatrice is uneasy their would-be benefactor claims they were a coven of witches beholden only to satan and his demonic misdeeds but beatrice is convinced something much darker than witchcraft is at play so that sounds decently exciting doesn't it um it was kind of clear from the blurb that well two things were very clear one that the tobacco merchant was definitely guilty which the book spends some time being coy about and also that witchcraft wasn't actually going to be the actual real story of what was going on it was going to be a pretense but i decided to give it a read anyway and there are some sort of decent witchy things in the book which uh, i'll get to shortly a little bit about the author graham masterton it says in the back of this particular copy of the book uh, graham masterton trained as a newspaper reporter before beginning his career as an author uh, and he has written a lot of horror novels and um, various other novels as well so i went to his wikipedia page to have a look and apparently he was the editor of mayfair and penthouse and has written quite a lot of um sexy stories shall we say um, and also sex guides uh, and stories that kind of revolve around horror and sex and this book is no exception so i'm going to trigger one for this because there were some alarmingly graphic um scenes in this book to do with sexual violence and sexual assault there is really no reading around them they were probably the most graphic ones that i have read so far in books for the podcast so steer well clear of this book if that is triggering to you and also um i'm going to be describing those events in this review so stop listening now if that is going to trigger you or upset you in any way because uh, i wouldn't want to be responsible for you uh, you know having a bad time i was quite perplexed by the fact that this guy has a lot of novels to his name like his wikipedia page is just a massively long list of stories and novels that he's written and published and i was quite surprised because reading the book it's not well written um there were quite a lot of occasions where there were like mistakes in, in the text uh, which I'll, I'll point out to you at, you know at various uh, points as i go through the book one thing that stuck out immediately and made me google the author to find out what he was doing and where he was from is the fact that he describes someone's eyes as amethyst blue when amethyst is purple so there's like basic things like that which were just sort of stumbling blocks to me as i was reading like hang on this this isn't right and also the fact that quite a lot of the dialogue is written in such a way that i don't think people would actually speak and some of it goes directly against some of the rules and things that are discussed in like even an undergraduate course in creative writing so We'll get into that as well as the plot. So the, the book opens 
with the main character Beatrice Scarlet, who's just been widowed, I assume, in the previous novel. And within the first couple of pages, we learn a little bit about Beatrice. She has two children, uh, a baby called Flory, who I think is about a year and a half old, uh, and a, a son named Noah, who I think is about five. And in the first couple of pages, he goes missing. She's hanging out laundry. She turns around. He's gone. And she's living in America and in like sort of frontier times. And it quickly becomes discussed that he has been abducted by Native Americans. And they're quite worried about getting him back. And a lot of this early portion of the book revolves around that search. I say a lot up until page 12, <laughs> because at the end of, of, of page 12, which is the end of, of chapter two, uh, she says this. She closed her eyes and said another prayer for Noah. But even as she did so, she accepted that she might never see him again or ever discover what had happened to him. At this point, I think he's been missing for a day and a half. So her five year old son has been missing for a day and a half uh, and she's already completely given up. Now, I accept that this is obviously like the 1700s, very different time to now where you know people can go on searching for years and years and years because it's a lot harder for people to just disappear now. Um, because we have so much CCTV and there's DNA testing and things like that and we can like track people down and at this time life was a lot more uncertain you know your kid could just be grabbed by a wolf and, and you'd never see them again but I feel like that's a quite a rational approach whereas you know this is her son the only living part of her husband as she's already talked about because her daughter Florence who's, who's the younger child is, is the product of a rape uh, so this is the only part of her husband that's still living and she gives up on that awful fast so um that already kind of shook me out of it and made me think like this isn't a particularly realistic way to react something that was quite gladdening is around the page 26 27 mark her cousin uh, jeremy comes to stay with her because obviously her son's gone missing although you know she's made peace with that uh, and in the middle of the night he after trying to woo her into marriage and her turning him down he just gets into bed with her and is like, oh, well, I love you so much that I, I just can't keep my hands to myself. And she pulls a pistol out from underneath her pillow and uh, deafens him with it by firing a warning shot. And and that's basically the, the sort of first sign we get that she actually has a little bit of character, a little bit of strength about her. Because up until now, she's just kind of been running around, wringing her hands and giving biscuits to her daughter and not really showing a lot of emotional reaction but this bit I quite liked it's a shame that later on in the book th this kind of get to it is it kind of abandons her so uh, I, I enjoyed it while it was there and the plot of the book revolves on the fact that she was married to a parson and that now that he is dead she has no right to stay in the house that came with his job and uh, another parson arrives and she is given the opportunity to, to return to England uh, where she was obviously born and raised to London to work in this refuge run by the church so she packs up with her daughter and leaves even though her son is missing perhaps dead she doesn't find try and find a way to, to stay in the locale she just goes to London so I, I mean I was on board with it because it, it moved the plot along slightly and once in London she starts working at the shelter St Mary Magdalene's and doing a lot of apothecary stuff mixing up treatments for head lice uh, the pox and various other things which was, was quite interesting to read about it was sort of probably one of the most witchy things in the book the fact that she was uh, creating these cures for people and also questioning as she went through the efficacy of some of the other treatments that were being offered on a more of a superstitious or outdated basis uh, that was quite interesting and i enjoyed that part of the novel shortly after her arrival and her getting to know some of the girls a particular jane who is a former prostitute and uh, an unrepentant prostitute until uh, Beatrice talks to her a little bit about it and assures her that God can grant her her virginity over again and all that stuff. Um, shortly after sort of making their acquaintances, you know, letting us know these characters, they are quickly dispatched to the tobacco factory where they are stripping tobacco leaves to make cigarettes and things but then when going to visit them Beatrice is told by the proprietor a guy kind of improbably named George Hazard she's told that they are very sick and cannot be visited because of the, the contagious nature of the illness we're introduced to George Hazard when he jumps out of a carriage waving a sword to defend Beatrice and uh, another lady she works with, Ida, uh, their honour against a bunch of rapist thieves, he kind of immediately seems like Lord Flashheart because one, how he showed up, 
and to just the name alone was quite amusing um but he says she she can't visit them because because they're ill and she kind of buys this and then leaves but then later concocts a, a remedy to take to them and upon reaching the tobacco factory is told that all of them are now gone in very suspicious circumstances uh, she's shown the girls room uh, to prove that they have in fact summon satan and become witches and that satan has given them the power to escape from the tobacco factory and uh, there's a large pentacle pentagram drawn on the wall and uh, it appears to be drawn in blood as a dead goat nailed to the wall which is obviously incredibly theatric lots of candles around and it seems obvious that uh, some sort of evil ritual has taken place but right off the bat Beatrice starts to notice things that don't make any sense like for example that the girls were supposedly in this room from the moment they arrived some days previously and yet none of the chamber pots appear to have been used somehow all of their clothes and belongings have also gone like how could they have done that uh, in the middle of the night without using a cart of so or some sort and therefore waking everybody else up a lot of this evidence isn't adding up and then she employs some sort of forensic testing to test uh, what appears to be blood but is actually paint suggesting that this whole scene has been staged so she's really suspicious right off the bat which is kind of good because i wasn't here for hanging around for a long time for her to realize that something was up and uh, she gets down to things and starts doing a little bit of prodding a little bit of digging and is rewarded for this with several satanic attacks on her which appear to also be these elaborate staged events to try and convince her that it really is a satanic matter and not one for the police i found it a little bit hard to believe the, the veracity with which people seem to believe that, that satan was responsible for this most of the people trying to pass it off as the work of satan are to be fair involved in the scheme and have a vested interest in it obviously not coming to light uh, but beatrice herself gives it some thoughts as well uh, about satan and god and does seem to be kind of a, a true believer but believes that satan is not involved in this case i found it kind of weird that no one would question this uh, more like the, the whole sort of satanic involvement uh, it just it seemed a little bit far-fetched to me uh, i'm not really sure how much i bought that as a plot element but it helped to move the plot along so uh, I, I wasn't terribly mad about it the next stage in beatrice's investigation is to uh, question a prostitute who has recently been recruited to mary magdalene's uh, about george hazard who she has previous knowledge of and this leads her to this fancy brothel for fancy people uh, and this is probably where one of the most grotesque scenes in the book takes place and to its credit it was actually quite shocking uh, she goes to the brothel and finds that these girls are being used in essentially live performance snuff um, where they are being murdered uh, for the gratification of the audience and this is described in quite graphic detail as are a number of very um, grotesque sex acts including things like bestiality and stuff like that so that was quite shocking and i felt like maybe slightly too gratuitous in places of uh, it was very vividly described where i didn't think it necessarily needed as much detail it could have done with maybe 30 percent less uh, if i'm being mathematical about it and it did give me the uncomfortable feeling that someone somewhere was getting off on this uh, which um was not pleasant in the reading but it did serve to heighten the stakes somewhat especially when uh, a friend of beatrice's is the next victim and she actually sees this murder happen live now you may think that that'd be all the evidence that she would require but no uh, from the sort of midway point onwards the book continually just flings up roadblocks to her going to the police first it's that no one will believe her about what she's seen at the brothel even though obviously at this point the the body of that poor girl is is still there uh, and i can kind of see that because no one in the audience is going to admit that they paid to see what they saw and i can kind of get on board with that but then it's just one thing after another she has to sneak into this place uh, in disguise and ask questions sneak into another place and it just feels quite tiresome especially the second time that she visits the brothel in a different disguise you just kind of think 
I feel like we're repeating ourselves here. In particular, there was one very low moment where in an effort to trace the whereabouts of a serving girl in, in the house where she's been staying of Afro-Caribbean descent, the, uh, Beat- the remarkable Beatrice decides in all her wisdom to pose as the girl's relative and go to a house where she has ostensibly been installed. But this is actually just a, a ruse to cover for her disappearance. So she gets some charcoal and some honey and some various other things, mixes herself some face paint and then blacks up and goes to the house to ask questions in uh, a put on accent, which I don't think one is a good idea at all, especially not to put in a modern novel because that's racist as hell. And two, I don't even think that it would work. So like if it had been something that could reasonably function as a disguise like just you know rubbing soot on your face and pretending to be a beggar or something I can kind of get behind that as a disguise attempt but this just doesn't seem like it would work crushing up some charcoal and just smearing it on your face with some other stuff it is not going to make you look like you're related to someone who is black it just doesn't seem like it works it it just boggled my mind is, is the way I'm going to put it I was mind boggled by the fact that this had been included in the novel at all and two that it had been included in the novel as a serious suggestion as to a disguise that would actually work in this situation so I had those two issues with it um, but thankfully this particular disguise is not repeated Throughout the investigation, we get like various similar situations kind of over and over again in that Beatrice will tell Ida, who's kind of the house mother of of the refuge who she works with, that she's going to buy apothecary ingredients and then she'll go off and do some investigating and then she'll come back and we'll get these sort of scenes of her having tea and thinking about what has just occurred. A lot of the scenes feel quite similar and that did become quite tiresome. Uh, But also, again, these sort of little mistakes started to crop up as on page... Uh, 229, 230. Uh, She's in a conversation with Ida in which she's saying that she doesn't particularly want to go to Bedlam and see the lunatics. Um, Also because she's going to sneak out and and do investigations, but I guess also because that's a pretty tacky thing to go and do. Um, But um, They're having this conversation and uh, this is the following thing that happens. I've arranged for a carpenter to come next week and replace this for you. It must be extremely disturbing for you to be constantly reminded that Satan is displeased with you. One really dreads to think in what way he might threaten you next. He's quite a conjurer, I grant him that, said Beatrice. If he could perform that goat's head trick in a theatre, I'm sure he'd make a fortune. Beatrice gave her one of her puckered rosebud smiles and said, Enjoy your walk. I'll make your excuses to the lunatic, shall I, and give them your best regards. I had to read that a couple of times, but basically what's happened is that somewhere in this conversation, the author has gotten lost because it's Ida talking to Beatrice about how she's having the door fixed and that her and the girls are going off to see the lunatics and Beatrice saying that she's going for a walk. And yet in this last section, Beatrice is the one to say, I'll make your excuses to the lunatics and give an insincere smile like she's hiding something. It's fairly obvious that this was meant to be Ida's line and her action, but the wrong name has been used and you think that any proofreader would have called that but apparently they didn't uh, the same is true later on right at the end of the of the book in the court case situation and uh, spoilers here because uh, the names of the participants in the crime do appear in this section that i'm about to read it's the beginning of chapter 46 on page 398 and it says Over the next three weeks, the weather grew increasingly bitter, and on the day that George Hazard and Leda Sheridan and Godfrey Minchin were brought up before the Old Bailey, the skies were charcoal grey and it was sleeting. One, that's a really long sentence. Uh, And two, they've used and twice in a list. So normally when, this is just a basic thing that you probably learned when you were doing GCSE English, when you're doing a list, you say something like, today at the supermarket I bought cheese, comma, apples, and beer so and goes before the last thing to signal kind of that it's the end of the list and also because otherwise you'd be reading a list that sounds like this today at the supermarket i bought cheese and apples and bread and beer and 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 it will just go on forever 
So it saves words, it makes it read a little bit more naturally and also will stop your sentence from being a mile long. But here we have George Hazard and Leader Sheridan and Godfrey Minchin instead of George Hazard, Leader Sheridan and Godfrey Minchin. Obviously, this is not a book breaking error. I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying that this was not the first time that I had seen this happen in the book. There were other instances where ands, 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 ands appeared in lists. We'd had already the amethyst blue eyes thing, which I still don't understand how that happened. And also some of the the other areas in terms of the wrong character names being used. And it just felt like, you know, this is a hardback book coming out, the number one international bestseller. You'd think they could have proofread it just a smidge better than they actually did. Now, um, one thing I did keep waiting to happen in the book was for a twist. So... I was sort of because we'd been told in the blurb that it was George Hazard who was sort of responsible for implicated in the disappearance of these girls. I was awaiting a twist. Someone else was going to be involved. Someone we didn't expect. That's normally what you would expect to happen. Maybe she would go to someone for help and they would seem that they were trying to help her. But actually they were betraying her. And the opportunity for this arises several times because Beatrice will not stop leaving her daughter with strangers. It was quite perplexing. First up, she leaves her daughter unattended at Mary Magdalene's, even when she knows that something's up there. Even when Ida keeps dropping these hints about, you know, you didn't believe in Satan and and now you're going to get got by him if you don't stop poking your nose into our business. She keeps leaving her like one and a half year old daughter with these people. Then she is um, unfortunately attacked at that place and then has to leave and take shelter elsewhere with a bunch of people she's never met before who their only association is that they are related to one of the prostitutes from the reform house that she knows and kind of trusts she then leaves her daughter unattended with them as well and i was fully expecting there to be a a moment where she returns and no one is there and there's a note that says you know if you want to see your daughter again stop poking your nose in but this doesn't happen. Um, the, what actually occurs is that the woman at that house is, a, is an old colleague of the brothel madam who is responsible for these shows. So she says that she can get Beatrice in there again uh, to look for some more missing girls that may or may not be hidden there. So she agrees. But halfway through, they are rumbled. And the woman turns on her and says, oh, I never knew that you were lying to me and then quickly makes her exit. It's kind of clear at this point that she has gone for the police. Uh, So it's sort of a waiting game just to see what will happen to Beatrice before the police arrive. And what happens is something incredibly unpleasant. So she's drugged and taken to the room with all the other girls who are being prepared for a special show. Uh, And we find out at this point that the apothecary who she's been hanging out with uh, to do some of her forensic testing and who works for the reform refuge is also implicated in this which would be shocking if to be honest we cared about him enough as a character which i personally didn't he was just incidentally there and i had no strong feelings about his betrayal at all what did annoy me is that obviously we had had this previous very graphic scene in which grace the missing housemaid had been decapitated mid coitus i'm gonna say I'm not going to like go into the details of what happened, but that's basically what happens to Grace. The the next show is just the same thing happening, but to the the five girls plus as a sort of a warm up act, Beatrice, and it kind of feels like that's less shocking the the second time around. Like you've already gone to the trouble of putting in this really shocking scene and other acts in that performance which are also as shocking it kind of feels weird that you would just do the same thing again but it's happening to five people now so it's five times as horrific because it's not really it's just the same amount of horrific that you haven't really upped the stakes at this point and that's not to say that i'm looking for them to put in another gory uh, very graphic scene but it would be i'm not going to say nice but it would have been more inventive to have something else happen to be a little bit more uncertain because what actually happens is Beatrice is is taken out for this opening act is sexually assaulted and then obviously you know that at some point she's going to be decapitated but she can't be because she's the main character of a series of books so just as the sword's coming down they burst in to arrest everyone and that made that kind of predictable because you know what the threat is. The threat here is that she is going to be decapitated. You know that that can't happen because she's the main character. So you know exactly at what moment the police are going to burst in. 
And it kind of takes away the element of surprise. And I know we're meant to be shocked and appalled that she has been sexually assaulted. And it is quite horrifying. But at the same time, nothing seems to emotionally affect this character for long. Like the loss of her son only went on for about 12 pages. She has been sexually assaulted before and doesn't really talk about that having much of an effect on her that much. uh, Because she still seems perfectly happy to hit on and associate with men who just appear and who she doesn't know she seems to just trust intrinsically it doesn't seem to have affected her in any way and this also doesn't affect her because straight after the event when she's been um seen naked by all of the people who have come to rescue her as well as being quite violently sexually assaulted and drugged she just gets up and continues with the investigation and at no point does it seem to have like an emotional hit on her and i'm all for a strong character for character showing strength in times of crisis but this continues to the rest of the book she doesn't even at the end of the book reflect on what has occurred or or seem emotionally touched by it at all uh, which didn't seem particularly realistic in terms of the impact such an improbably traumatic event would have had on her like this was not just traumatic in the normal sense this is engineered to specifically be incredibly traumatic and she just does not have a reaction to it at all then in what seems like not enough pages at the end of the book we get a sort of court case where the members of this conspiracy are brought to justice and beatrice has to testify in court but she doesn't testify properly she testifies for dramatic effect because she gives her testimony about everything that's happened so far in the book all of the different aspects and then the lawyer who is defending the mostly George Hazard I think at this point uh, refutes all of her claims puts it down to Satan the rest of the rest of it and then right at the end she jumps up and says but uh, actually I can disprove all of that with this other piece of evidence which she already had because we saw her test the uh, girls who first disappeared for poisons she knows what was used to kill them and that this implicates George but she doesn't say that until right at the end Whereas I feel like if you're testifying, you should just testify all at once. Uh, And again, that feels kind of crudely set up for dramatic effect and not terribly realistic. And then in a final act of defiance, she is attacked in the courtroom and manages to uh, succeed uh, in defending herself in that sense. And then in like the last two pages, her son turns up. It's literally like the last two pages, her cousin, who you might remember at the start of the book, also attempted to sexually assault her, but again this is not something that she thinks about or seems to remember he just turns up and says oh well it's a way to make it up for you for making a coward of myself i went and uh, found myself a guide and managed to rescue a son from native americans and i've brought him all the way to england for you and then they're like oh and the dog that her daughter found at uh, some point in the novel which she named after her missing brother is summarily renamed after the guy who was sort of the love interest for this novel and who got gruesomely murdered about two thirds of the way through so he's now memorialized as the name of a dog because that's a good way to literally the, those are the last words in the novel the, the renaming of the dog uh, which is very strange so there you go so did i enjoy this book um here's the thing i didn't like it i, I found it to be kind of sensationalist very um very graphic in places that it didn't really need to be seemingly just for the shock value but like all thrillers once you're in it you want to know what happened you want to get to the end of the book so in that sense i did kind of enjoy it because i I was getting through it the thing that annoyed me is when we got to the end there wasn't really a twist the blurb tells us who is responsible we find out who is responsible fairly on in the novel and then it's just a question of other people being brought to light but because they don't seem particularly realistic or multi-dimensional characters i wasn't really affected by the revelation of their betrayal even the dangerous situations that affect beatrice the main character i don't really care that much because beatrice isn't really a character she's just kind of a mary sue that walks around telling people about apothecary stuff and being good at forensic science uh, and also being of profound moral character she doesn't really have any flaws she doesn't really have any behavior at all or a personality so in that sense she is is quite hard to get on with and that may be because i didn't read the first book in the series but also her character isn't really developed in this second book either so that was kind of a a point not in its favor 
What I did find interesting from a sort of witch perspective in it was the fact that George Hazard, and I think another character at some other point in the novel, uh, or it might just be him again, but calls Beatrice a witch and says that she's the true witch in this scenario uh, and that she deserves to be punished like one. And I liked the idea of the witch being not this kind of Christian idea of sacrificing goats and gaining the powers of Satan, but the idea of someone who goes against what is seen to be irrefutable fact in the sort of conscious of this Christian public. She's the one who says, actually, this probably isn't Satan. There's probably a scientific explanation behind this. She's in pursuit of truth in terms of what is hidden from her, these secrets and lies that are being bandied about by people around her. And she's not really looking at what is Christian in terms of the morality. She wants to protect people who for the most part, even by the characters who are meant to be Christian, like the reverend in the book, who are treated as lost causes, people who cannot be saved, people who are less than human because of the fact that they've sold their bodies for money. So in that sense, I kind of liked the exploration of what it is to be a witch. I don't think that that was intentional on the part of the author, but as a sort of modern pagan reading it, there's an interesting appeal in a female character who walks the line between knowledge and ignorance and is punished and attacked because of that insistence on what is real and and what is just superstitious belief so i quite liked that aspect to it it was quite a satisfying book in the sense that at the end even though you kind of did know everyone who was involved with it from the word go they were at least brought to justice and uh, justice was eventually had the plotting of it was although repetitive quite tight there weren't really any plot holes and aside from some of the mistakes which i've sort of touched upon in this review it did read all right although again the uh, the dialogue and everything was a little bit um, unbelievable at times so not particularly one i would recommend in terms of witchy content but definitely one that was sort of an interesting look uh, but if you're going to pick it up just because it's called the coven and seems to suggest that it has stuff to do with apothecaries and witches you're going to be disappointed i think by the lack of true witchy content in the book i hope you've enjoyed this review don't forget to drop me a line on twitter and email i hope that this coronavirus thing is over by the time this episode goes out and that this will just be a fascinating throwback to you know that time in march when we couldn't go outside but in the meantime stay safe and uh, i'll see you in the next one bye